that trial was a thousand patients and we found cancer in 4.4% of those patients. So actually a much larger number than a lot of people would expect. The main reason for that was that this was the first scan a lot of folks had done. And it turns out that cancer takes quite some time to grow. So the detection window is quite broad. Welcome back to the Fit Insider Podcast. I'm your host, Joe Venere. Today I'm joined by Andrew Lacey, founder and CEO of Pernuvo. In this episode, we discuss the future of preventative care. Andrew talks about the company's full body scans for early disease detection. Plus, we explore tech's impact on the reactive nature of healthcare. Let's get into it. The Fit Insider Podcast is brought to you by Jack Taylor, our exclusive PR partner. More than just PR, they're creative storytellers and brand builders who actually understand the health and wellness industry. To learn more, head to jacktaylorpr.com slash fit. That's F-I-T-T. Hi, Andrew. Welcome to Fit Insider. Thanks for joining us. Thank you very much, Joe. It's great to be here. Yeah, a lot to get into today. We chatted a little bit offline, like some news breaking around what you're working on. So we can we can certainly get into that. But maybe to kick things off for folks who aren't familiar, just tell us a little bit about your background and what you're working on at Pernubo. Sure. So I'm uh, originally from Australia. I moved over to the US uh, 20 years ago almost to um, to study in Northern California. I fell in love with startups. My first company actually was the very first iPhone company uh, back in 2008 and built a couple of companies since then. And sort of my entrepreneurial midlife crisis was that I really wanted to, for my next company, be something that would both be meaningful in terms of size, but also meaningful in terms of human impact. And that led me down the path to founding Pernuvo and working on bringing these life-saving early diagnostic scans to as many people as possible. Yeah, I think the the idea right around transforming what some people, and I'm, you might say this, I won't put words in your mouth, I'll let you say it, but what is maybe a, a broken or reactive approach to healthcare, certainly not centering on prevention, at least not to the extent of maybe looking at other otherwise healthy people and trying to set a baseline, maybe where we are today and, and tracking that over time. We've, we've certainly seen with, you know, innovation around fitness apps and now even medical grade technologies in terms of wearables, sensors, everything from health trackers to non-invasive glucose monitors, right? This kind of idea of democratizing access to this information, health data and prevention you all are taking a little bit different approach in terms of scans and, and using a whole host of technologies. So what does that the actual experience look like for the consumer and from a technology side that enables us to even do this in the first place? Just to start and pick up on what you said, I mean, it's such a fantastic time to be in preventive health. You know, I think for the first time in a long time, people are really starting to question whether the reactive healthcare system that we have is the right one and whether it's really serving our needs. And that's come about just in the last few years as you've had a lot of companies, uh, typically uh, you know, somewhat outside of the health system, bringing really interesting, innovative, preventive health products to market. And it's forcing a lot of people to ask questions about you know, at a really fundamental level, what is healthcare and what should it be? And mm -hmm. that's one of the questions that I had as a, as a founder myself. I reached my 40s and I said to myself, well, I should be most concerned about whether I'm healthy right now. And I went and did a bunch of tests and those tests felt like they told me really valuable information about a certain part of my health, but there was nothing that was very comprehensive. And it was only when I first experienced this scan as a patient, you know, I went to our, our clinic in Vancouver, Canada, uh, that was run by the founding radiologist at the time. And I did a one hour scan. And after that scan, I sat down with the radiologist and learned more about my health than I had learned from the medical profession my entire life. And it was just so clear to me that this was just such a transformationally different approach, brought me tremendous peace of mind about my overall health. And then also a number of things that I could work on as an individual. And from that moment on, that was my, my mission was clear. I really wanted to work to bring this to as many people as possible. And now we're in eight locations in the US and growing and, you know, saved a lot of lives already in the last few years. Yeah, I think it's, it's something that you know, as you start to focus on your health and, and unfortunately, to some extent, it's a luxury, right? To, to say just beyond how am I feeling, but also prioritizing 
exercise, nutrition, mental health, sleep. To some extent, they're all common sense, right? Doing the fundamentals and investing in yourself, but oftentimes, you know, kind of fall by the wayside. Then you get to this next step of tracking, monitoring, even even analog, like food logs, right? Workout journals, uh, habit trackers. But now we're talking about, you know, walking into a facility and getting a full body scan, right? That you said, you sit down with a, a radiologist and kind of go over the results. What What is that actual kind of experience? Like if I went to get one of the scans, maybe the process, and then what type of information am I getting in addition to the findings, right? In terms of education or lifestyle change, or even, you know, recommendations in terms of how to improve upon what I might've seen in that scan. Sure. Well, a fundamental principle that makes us different to a regular healthcare system is really you're the customer, not your health insurance plan. Mm -hmm. And so the experience sort of reflects that. The facilities that we have in most of the major markets now are sort of spa-like facilities. It's a very warm, comforting environment. It doesn't feel like you're entering a hospital. It's designed to not make you feel like you're sick because the vast majority of people that come in actually are not. They care about their health. You come in, you get changed. Um, we put you in a machine for about 53 minutes, sometimes a couple minutes more if we have to repeat a piece of the scan. You watch a streaming uh, video while you're in there. So you can watch your favorite next Netflix yeah. show. The scan is over faster than you thought it would be. And then about a week or so later, uh, you receive a really detailed medical report, an app with all of your images and that goes through every organ of the body, every condition that we look for. And if we find something, what is it? What did we find? How significant is it? And what should you do about it? And so the goal really is, this sounds really normal if you don't come from the health world, but this is the sort of experience that you would want to create, but it's not really how the health system traditionally has worked. And, and the goal here really is to put the patient at the center of their own health, to give them all the information they need in order to make better decisions about the way they live their life. And if they have a medical issue that needs to be followed up in the health system, they can engage with the health system from the point of view of having knowledge and really being able to sort of a champion and sort of uh, get resolution in a lot, lot more effective way. Yeah, right. It's interesting having this conversation. Just recently, I had an MRI on my knee. Um, I've been having some pretty persistent and chronic pain and, you know, wanted to get it looked at and was looking at all different services that I could get in terms of basically injections, everything from stem cells to blood and, and all this stuff, not in, you know, to avoid having surgery. And that process, I think, took about three months just to, to get the scan, get it approved, see where I could go, get the results, which I had to physically drive there and pick up, um, then drive to the other place that I was, you know, delivering them and, and hoping to get treatment. So in the US, right, it's, I have, you know, great health insurance, but even that process, pretty crazy um, for an issue that I knew I had and wanted to get resolved, let alone just trying to do it from a preventative standpoint. Um, that, that brings up the issue of cost, right? So it's not cheap to do this. It it does, can be uh, kind of prohibitive. How much is it for the the scan, maybe even like the, the complete service? And how do you think about like that barrier to entry for some people who may not have access? Sure. So we offer a number of different scans, but if I talk about the two ends of the, pro, the sort of the bookends of the menu, I guess, at the low end, we have a torso cancer scan that looks for cancer anywhere in the torso. And that's a thousand dollars. And then we have a comprehensive exam at the other end where we look in every organ and we look for things other than cancer, and that's $24.99. This might sound expensive, but in that comprehensive exam, we're actually doing the equivalent of 22 single body part MRI exams. And if you paid out of pocket for any one of these, you might pay up to $2,000. So um, in some ways, it's $50,000 of imaging for $24.99. And uh, obviously, as a company, we're working really hard to, as we scale up, find ways to bring the cost down and make it more accessible to people. My dream one day is a $500 scan that you would do every two years, just like you, you go periodically to the dentist, but rather than looking at your teeth, we're looking at the entire rest of your body. Yeah, I think that was a question I had too. In terms of you know, having the scan, then having follow-ups, whether that's additional scans, is this an, an annual, how often do you recommend them? And, you know, 
what then does that look like in terms of coming back, you know, talking about paying for the scan one time, other folks have kind of thought about this in terms of like a subscription, bundling it with like some type of primary care service. Curious how you think about, you know, that model overall and what you recommend to people, you know, in terms of like follow up and just continuing care. Well, first of all, the way I think about repeating the scan sort of periodically, there's sort of two ways to look at it. One is, and I'm sure your listeners are familiar with the terms lifespan and health span. So from a lifespan point of view, this is how long we live. We're mainly concerned about making sure that we catch life-threatening conditions early. And for the average person, average risk, probably doing one of these scans every two years is going to be sufficient. And for that, we can rely on a lot of evidence in the breast cancer screening space where mammography used to be every two years, mainly because if a cancer started the year after, you know, straight after you got a scan, it would still be stage one two years later. When we think about health span, what's really interesting and insightful about these exams is not just what they can tell you that you have, but also can tell you a lot about how the way you're living your life is affecting your underlying physiology. So I'll give you an example. I'm now standing on a walking treadmill desk because when we as a company raised money a year and a half ago, I could literally see from my scan how my cervical spine was straightening from the stress of that fundraising process. And so you can imagine, you know, for someone that if you have a job or you're the sort of person that has chronic stress, we can see how that's actually impacting the physiology of your body. It could be obviously in this case, your MSK, so your spine, but often smoking or blood pressure or cholesterol, we see the impact of that, the end organ damage in the brain or the lungs or the liver. And so just knowing about these things enables our patients to make much smarter choices about the way they live their life and hopefully avoid ever actually arriving at the stage where they have chronic disease, never actually having to engage the health system in order to manage these chronic conditions, because that's where the vast majority of health span actually is, is in chronic healthcare. Yeah, I think, and you you may have touched on this, but you talk about your your personal experience there. And if somebody were to go get a scan, obviously, if it's something as serious as a cancer diagnosis, or certainly requiring additional kind of follow ups, that's you know you take that information, you engage with kind of the traditional healthcare system, and, and potentially get that figured out from the perspective of maybe, hey, we saw some things, here's what we've identified. Um, is there the component of lifestyle intervention, education, programs that you offer as part of that to say, hey, here's now, we saw this with your spine. We saw the impact of smoking on your body. Here's what you need to do now. Or is it the findings and then you know seeking kind of the, the intervention piece elsewhere? If I'm being totally honest, um, we don't really do too much of that ourselves. We obviously want to educate the patient about what they have and what we think they should do, but it's a pretty complicated business developing these world-leading diagnostic screenings. And there are other folks out there that are just tremendously good at what they do about helping patients on diet or exercise or posture or core strength. And so I think patients are reasonably good at then finding out what providers they need to work with beyond that. And maybe over time, we partner with some of these organizations. Yeah. And I think the the other thing that comes to mind is what have people experienced? What, what kind of results have you found? What have you identified? I don't want to like success story sounds like the wrong word because you're identifying, right? Like a, an ailment and in some cases cancer, but are there instances that you were able to intervene that had some type of kind of positive outcome? Yeah, I mean, I can speak about a clinical trial we did a few years ago that we're in the process of repeating, but that trial was a thousand patients and we found cancer in 4.4% of those patients. So actually a much larger number than a lot of people would expect. The main reason for that was that this was the first scan a lot of folks had done. And it turns out that cancer takes quite some time to grow. So the detection window is quite broad. And relatedly, of those cancers that we found, the overwhelming majority of them were stage one. So it's led us to believe now that for most cancers, you know, they are detectable and still localized oftentimes for two, three, four years. So the window of detection is pretty broad. And it means that for patients that come in and where we make one of these findings, often the treatment that they have to then follow up with is much easier to tolerate and is much more likely to be successful because the cancer is so early. We also find 
aneurysm in about 1% of patients. Obviously, aneurysm is something, if, they're large, if it's large enough or you have risk factors, you really want to handle sooner rather than later because it's, you know, it, it, when it bursts, the outcome is not so great. And then just to reiterate, I mean, most everyone that comes in has a finding or two or three. And uh, the vast majority of those are things that can be managed either relatively easily by the medical system or, you know, by changing lifestyle. Hey, everyone. We'll get you back to the show in just a second. But first, I wanted to tell you about our exclusive PR partner, Jack Taylor. Honestly, this one's a no-brainer. We've known the Jack Taylor team for years. They work with some of the most innovative health and wellness companies. We're talking Whoop, Athletic Greens, Hyper Ice, and many more. Jack Taylor has an extensive industry network, knows how to work with high growth companies, and really invests in building long-term relationships. I know this firsthand because they're Fit Insider's PR agency, so I can confidently recommend them, and I do all the time. From startups to more established brands, they go beyond pushing product to help companies truly thrive. To learn more, head to jacktaylorpr.com slash fit. That's F-I-T-T. Now back to the show. When you think about shifting away from this reactive care, it doesn't get much more kind of powerful than having that knowledge, awareness to do something about these things that you're, you know, in 4% of people or 1% of people for aneurysms. Now, I was going to say that a bit the problem with reactive care, there's sort of two problems, really. One is a lot of conditions just don't have symptoms until it can be quite advanced. So pancreatic cancer is sort of an obvious one where until it actually starts to block the bile duct and you you don't really feel any symptoms. And, and by the time it's doing that, it tends to be stage four and um, pretty late. And that's why it's considered a terminal cancer. Other conditions, you know, even when there are symptoms, those symptoms are often pretty indeterminate. Like the number one or most common symptom of gallbladder cancer is pain in the shoulder. So if you're a golfer or a tennis player that constantly has, you know, now most likely it's just tennis pain or golf pain. But, you know, the problem with even listening to your body sometimes is the symptoms are pretty like indeterminate. I had a friend of mine who had her only symptom was dull pain in her calves. And she went to the doctor. The doctor said, it's probably exercise related. Come back later if it's still here. She came back. Then she was sent to a physio. She did some physio, didn't treat, didn't fix it. Then eventually the physician said, well, let's just get a lumbar MRI because that's where the nerve cells come off, you know, that feed the legs. So probably if there's a problem, it might be there. She did a lumbar MRI, nothing. And that was actually the end of her care journey. And she came in for a scan a, a few months later and we found like a big problem with her cervical spine that was actually causing these symptoms in her lower leg. And so sometimes the traditional health system just never arrives at the diagnosis. Or sometimes it can arrive very slowly. And so between not having symptoms, having symptoms that are confusing to you as a patient and to the medical system, or just how long it takes to work through all of the possible sort of permutations of what might be causing it, the problem that you're experiencing, you can imagine, I mean, that's part of the reason why everything is diagnosed just at such an advanced stage in our health system. Yeah, it's it's hard to rationalize like how that happens I, i'm thinking of instances in my family where people have you know had different ailments cancer and they went through all the tests they saw every specialist and doctor and in some cases it wasn't until very late that it ended up being discovered and in others it, they never discovered it until you know basically after they passed away unfortunately is it that you're using a different technology altogether to do the scans or is it that you're just taking a different approach in terms of doing the actual analysis and looking more closely, maybe where others might not be willing to invest that kind of time or, or resources? Yeah, there's really two things. First of all, all of the imaging that we take is clinical diagnostic quality. So the images that we take of your head are the equivalent to what you would get if you just had a head MRI. And that, that means that you can always take them and get a second opinion. And if another radiologist looks at it, they know exactly what they're looking at. And this is um, unique from attempts at doing screening in the past, which were much more non-diagnostic. Think of it, it's the difference between taking a photo of your body with an iPhone 14, which is kind of what we do. And you know the older school approaches are much more sort of uh, Nokia cell phone level quality imaging. And you just can't see as much and you see a lot more indeterminate findings. Uh, so that's the first thing that's different. And then the second thing is we're really one of the leaders in the world at a technique called whole body diffusion imaging. 
I won't get into exactly what that means, but fundamentally um, what we're able to do with this imaging is we can feel for hardness anywhere in the body. So you might recall that women sort of feel their lumps, that feel, feel their breasts for lumps. And that works because not all cancers, not all lumps are cancers, but almost all solid tumors are more, more hard than the surrounding tissue. And so we're able to, with an MRI machine, digitally kind of essentially feel all of your body, including the parts that you normally can't feel like a pancreas or lungs or kidneys and so on. And that we're able to be much more precise for early stage cancer than previous attempts. As you start to go on this path, and it, it, admittedly, this is not my area of expertise, but in trying to become more educated about it, you start to look at uh, the pros and cons of basically doing screenings in term, including whole body imaging for like otherwise healthy individuals. And there are some people that kind of sit in the camp of very much where you are, where it's like the prevention, having the awareness, needing to do it, all the benefits that come with that. And then there's kind of the other side of it, which is that's a cost that you really don't need to make if you're healthy or otherwise, because you will inevitably find something. And if you find something, you're just going to chase that thing. And maybe there's a risk in terms of then follow-up or biopsy or lots of other things that you didn't ultimately do. How do you kind of rationalize that? Is that the case, realizing that the, maybe the other side of the debate is not here, right? So just giving you the opportunity to say like, that is or isn't true, or this is how you've thought about it and approached it and, and what it means. Yeah, I think this is also mainly rooted in just a lack of understanding about how these technologies have advanced in general and more precisely what it is that we do at Pranuvo. So uh, when a, a lot of physicians perhaps are thinking about screening, they're thinking about the techniques and approaches that were non-diagnostic and done, you know, and kind of discredited many years ago. And as you know, doctors are busy people, so they don't always also do the analysis or really, you know, work hard to educate themselves on what's different. It's much easier to say, you know, don't trust those guys. So, so we're, we work really hard to educate people and not just individuals, but also consumers. What we do at Pranuvo is, you know, we risk stratify everything that we find. And in fact, we're part of a working group that's building standards internationally around lesion detection in different organs of the body. And the whole goal of that is to be able to stratify everything that we see into a, a five point scale where one and two are benign, four and five are quite concerning and three is indeterminate. And our goal as a business is to make sure that category three, the indeterminate is as small as possible by making the imaging as precise and accurate as possible. And it's those indeterminate findings are the ones that require follow-up. What's really interesting and sort of a paradigm shift for the medical profession is the vast majority of those indeterminate findings are indeterminate because they're small. And so if a patient is coming in to get routine screening every year or so, then we have an opportunity to follow that over time. And we can see in which, you know, that indeterminate lesion does it end up being a benign lesion or does it end up being malignant? And if it ends up being malignant, it's still early enough that, you know, that it's a very early diagnosis. Do you think given the way both technology innovation is headed and also kind of a growing interest in people, you know, taking control over their own health, over their own health data, over that, over that kind of well-being journey, right? We even talk about health span and lifespan. That's not something people were talking about, you know, maybe a decade ago, maybe they were, but it was a smaller group. Do you think it inevitably goes the direction of we are doing more preventative scans, even within the traditional healthcare industry, so much so that, you know, you mentioned making the scans as cheap as $500. Does it go that way or is it we're further away from maybe this becoming more mainstream than would be beneficial to most people? I generally feel like this is a, we're at a seminal moment in our healthcare actually. And, and I think some part of that is all these companies that are that have built these preventive health solutions. Some part of this is people coming out of COVID. I mean, who had heard of a comorbidity before COVID? The people that were dying of COVID had usually had underlying medical conditions. And the vast majority of those people didn't know they actually had those conditions. And so we come out of it, you know, we're all a little bit more, you know, I think we're with a renewed interest in preventive health. And I think this is helping to shape the dialogue with insurance companies and employers about, you know, what does healthcare actually mean? And, you know, why is it only this reactive stuff and why isn't there more 
sort of preventive components to it. And we're starting to um, work now with several employers who are doing this for all of their employees. Um, we're working with physician groups that are integrating this into their standard of care annual screening process. And so it's really, really exciting, to be honest. And, and I think eventually it's not just going to be the evidence that will encourage the health system to adopt this more universally, but it's it's going to be consumers like you, I, the people that come in as patients that start to say, you know what, this is healthcare and this is the healthcare, more importantly, that we really think we need to have. And this should be part of the system, not something that, you know, we have to engage with ourselves as we do today. Yeah, absolutely. I think I think that's that's very much the hope and the the optimism of, you know, trying to balance this like the amount, well, just frankly, the amount of money we spend on healthcare already and the fact that life expect expectancy in the US is declining, that health outcomes are declining, the the rates of obesity, diabetes, heart disease, cancers, like trying to reconcile those two things, right? Like how we bridge that gap between the innovation and prevention and, and all of those things that are possible with where we stand today. And yeah, I agree that coming out of COVID, certainly that there was this kind of tailwind, right? That's, hey, we now we need to do something about this across all the aspects of what a healthy lifestyle is. Is there a point, can you like look at demand for scans and say, oh, this, this is not Anecdotally, we saw the numbers increase, the the number of people coming through, the number of employers or doctors reaching out to you. Was that like a kind of data point that you had and can point to in terms of the interest in this growing? 100%. I mean, we were even sort of six months into COVID, we were bigger. You know, we had more patients coming in than we had before COVID. So I would say the awareness grew a lot. And the thing that's most interesting, and maybe when I look at this industry outside in, it's something that I did not appreciate but that I now appreciate a lot, which is I think there's an unfair characterization of wellness that the only people that are interested in this are rich people that don't have anything else to spend their money on. And, you know, when we look at our patient population, actually, they come from all walks of life. At, at one point, we did a small little survey just to understand the wealth of people that came in and it reflected the average wealth of the markets in which we served. Now, what does that mean? It sort of is obvious. It means that healthcare is something that's really important for everyone. And maybe some people have a greater means to pay for it, but that doesn't mean people don't save and want to invest in this because it's something that's important for them. They want to be around for as long as possible. They want to be there as parents to their kids, or they want to be around to see their grandkids. We had a woman on just, we had a comment on Instagram the other day, yesterday from a woman who said, look, I saved, I decided not to have a coffee every day for two years you know, at a Starbucks in order to save enough money to come in and get a scan because this is important to me and it was the best investment I ever made. You know, so there's a demand for this that goes beyond just folks that are willing to pay. And I think also speaks for just how important this is for the for the healthcare system to adopt much more broadly. Yeah, I agree. To that point and around maybe how you see this continuing to, to grow and evolve, uh, maybe a couple more questions before we wrap up. Uh, you mentioned having kind of eight locations now, continuing to expand. I think it was last fall, the company raised like some $70 million. So certainly in kind of a, a growth and expansion mode, like what does that actually look like in terms of implementing that expansion? And, and what does that look like maybe even over the back half of this year? Yeah, so we're really investing the money in one of two ways. First of all, we can only have impact if we're able to screen patients. So a big part of that is opening up more locations. And uh, we hope by in a year from now, we'll be in pretty much every major city in the US and hopefully even potentially in one or two international markets. So that's kind of a core focus for the company. The second area we're investing uh, a lot of time and money is in AI and AI research. And um, this is really important, not just because it's a, sort of a buzzword today, but it's important because, you know, to scale this up to population scale, AI will need to play a role just because there isn't enough radiologists in the, in the US today to even be able to provide this screening for every person out there. So we have to find ways to use AI to make, the radio, make radiologists more accurate and more effective. And so that's a big part of our focus. And then secondly, AI is able to really 
derive insights from the imaging that we take that radiologists really couldn't practically do. So to give an example, we have research models that can measure the three-dimensional volume of visceral fat in the body or pericardial fat around the heart, which is closely associated with heart attack or the amount of liver fat to two decimal points. And so, or to measure brain volume and how that brain volume is changing over time so that we can maybe identify cognitive decline a lot earlier when you can still actually make changes, you know, lifestyle, diet and health changes that can affect the outcome. So a lot of these things are really enabled by AI because practically speaking, radiologists, you know, they're very wonderful people as it comes to diagnosing medical conditions, but some of these volumetric analyses, it just, it's very, very difficult to do with the human eye and AI is really good at that. So measuring these small changes over time, we think can really help people understand their health, you know, in a much more profound way, a lot earlier in their sort of health trajectory. Yeah, I think it is maybe at this point, right, a buzzword, but certainly the the application and the potential of AI is huge. We We see it now from, you know, even analyzing the tones in your voice to identify cognitive decline or mental health issues, certainly looking at health data and, you know, identifying again, some sort of condition that maybe you wouldn't have otherwise seen. And in this case, looking at the scans, it's always, I'm sure, been a consideration, hey, how do we integrate this technology in a way that can help us enhance the the results of the, the, the diagnostics? How much of a jump or acceleration has it been maybe even since the start of this year? Is it markedly different in terms of what's potential and how quickly you might be able to implement it? Or, or is it still actually in that hype cycle where we're saying the potential is massive and now we're just talking about it more? Well, as a business, we're, we're exploring ways to use AI, just like any other business. You know, We have engineering and AI has potential to make that more productive. Uh, we have a marketing team. I, they're experimenting with AI and so on. But as it relates to image analysis, the sort of work that radiologists are doing I don't know that there's going to be a lot of change in the super short term. And the main reason for that is all of this advance, um, this is a bit inside baseball, but the advance, the large language model approach that have sort of heralded in chat GPT and so on, they just require such a volume of data that there may well be not enough image data in the world to even sort of develop models with accuracy that makes sense. Uh, and so I think that's a, it's a long way away. And it probably would be another type of model approach that you know that we don't even know today that will bear fruit in the imaging space so i don't see any big changes in image analysis and radiology driven by these you know what we're seeing today but we're always evaluating it and every time i open up my twitter there's a new thing that i want to test and i tested i uploaded an image of a person with a liver a liver lesion yesterday in one of these models and i said well you know describe what's in the picture and it said this is someone with a brain tumor so you know, the models are not there yet um, and may well not be there for some period of time as it relates to radiology. So, you know, we've made a decision as a company that, you know, really what distinguishes us is the quality and training and the community of radiologists that we have and the work they do to go through so many images of so many organs of the body and work together to, you know, to be as accurate as possible. And, and, and I think AI is going to help them be more accurate and more productive, but I don't think it'll replace them anytime soon. Yeah, I think the underlying goal is still the same, right? Which is increase access to the scans, get more people scanned, understand what's going on. And to whatever extent AI is able to help in that process, you're still going to have to get the, the people in the scans in the first place. So uh, that can continue to remain the goal into the, the future uh, until otherwise uh, AI can help with the process. And I'm not sure we're ready as a society to, I mean, I think mentally, I still think we, I'm not sure we want doctors, uh, want AI to be had doctors just yet. And I think the sort of the error rate that we're seeing these days might work in a marketing context, but when you're talking about someone's health, like you really want to be pretty accurate. Yeah. I think I just read a, a survey the other day that it was like 70 plus percent of people aren't ready in a clinical setting to, to kind of hand off the, the diagnostic interpretation analysis to AI completely. So I do think there will be some pushback. And like you said, when I'm scrolling on Twitter, everything I, I see is like AI to write a thread better or a marketing post or copywriting or conversion page, much different than when you're talking about uh, diagnosing uh, cancer potentially. For sure. 
yeah, but you know, I say well, the world is moving fast, so I think maybe we have a different conversation in a year's time. Yeah, we'll be we'll be certainly following following along until then. And listen, hey, if it can help make a, a difference as it relates to uh, prevention and health and outcomes, um, I'm all for it. And I think that's why it's exciting, both what you're working on and the potential, you know, going forward. As we wrap up, we'll actually get you out of here on this. For people who are interested, whether it's in learning more, potentially coming in to get a scan, um, where would you point them? What's the the kind of best place to get started? Sure. Well, we're a clinical company first, so um, people are welcome to reach out either online or on the phone. We have phone numbers people can call in. And the goal is just to educate folks about the scan and uh, ask whatever questions they need to figure out whether it's appropriate for them. Um, we have an independent physician that also reviews everyone's charts just to make sure that you know, they're going to get out of the scan what they hope to get out. But, you know, you can book online, you can book over the phone. Uh, and we'd be excited to see people into the, you know, our eight going on nine clinics over here in the in the US. That's awesome. Yeah, we'll have all the details in the show notes. We'll encourage people to to learn more and look out. Um, we'll certainly be following as, as things continue to evolve, but it was a great conversation. Thank you so much for making time today. No worries. It's been great to chat. One more thing before you head out. Help us spread the word. Take a minute to rate and review the podcast, subscribe to the YouTube channel, or share this episode with a friend. And if you like conversations like this, you'll love the Fit Insider newsletter. We send it every Tuesday. The link is in the description. Thanks again for listening. We'll see you back here next week.